Welcome back again to another episode. Tonight we're going to continue looking at legitimation crisis, but we're going to be filling in what you could say is kind of a blank space that is definitely another one of these aspects of Habermas's discussion. It's part of the basics discussion of critical theory that goes back to Horkheimer and Adorno, um, which is the Marxist concept of social crisis and the Marxist concept of social change and how that occurs and how that relates to Marx's theory of history called dialectical materialism or historical materialism. We're going to be looking at that a little bit tonight. And we're going to try to transition from that topic into the topic of how critical theory sees itself, or tries to see itself, tries to constitute itself as a, an approach to society that's rooted in Marxism without necessarily buying into classical Marxism itself. So... This is going to be kind of an exploration into what we can take from classical Marxism once its weaknesses and deficiencies are fully recognized. The deficiencies that I have in mind are aspects of economic theory that Marx relied on when he was trying to create his argument for the inevitability of a communist revolution, which is something that current Marxists themselves and uh, critics of Marxism agree is a flawed argument. So let's begin. The starting point in the text, in the text of legitimation crisis, is actually uh, page two. So this is, this is the text, and you could consider this a commentary on this text or a close reading on the text. It's said that Heidegger and afterward Derrida spent an entire semester just commenting on one sentence. Um, so we've managed to do considerably more than that in our discussion of legitimation crisis. But what we've been doing is, is really deep readings, commentaries, that at the same time give some breadth to our, or hopefully give some breadth to our understanding of the text as a whole. So uh, without getting sidetracked into Heidegger and Derrida, let's proceed directly to uh, the text that I'm going to use as our breaking off point. So uh, page two, Legitimation Crisis. Thus, Marx developed for the first time a social scientific concept of system crisis. It is against this background that we speak today of social or economic crises. When, for instance, we mention the great economic crisis of the early 30s, the Marxian overtones are unmistakable. But I do not wish to add to the history of Marxian dogmatics yet another elucidation of his crisis theory. My aim is rather to introduce systematically a social, a social scientifically useful concept of crisis. So you can see at the very end there that Habermas is, is sort of leaving an um, implicit recognition that there are some deficiencies with the classical Marxist view of social crisis and how social crises come about. And what he has in mind there is almost certainly the Marxist idea that a communist revolution is inevitable, that it's determined by the forces within capitalism themselves, and that all we need to do as good Marxists, if we take ourselves to be good Marxists, is simply to figure out how to assist the flow of history toward that inevitable result. Or perhaps engage with the 
possible implication there that if it is inevitable, we don't need to do anything at all. So however uh, Marxists might want to grapple with the inevitability of the communist revolution, contemporary Marxists such as Habermas have recognized its deficiencies. And let me just go into a little more depth exactly what those are. So the uh, inevitability of communism was for Marx based on the idea of exploitation being a basic essential part of the way that profit is generated in a capitalist society. And the idea is that going back to something called the labor theory of value, which is a theory that he took from Ricardo and Adam Smith, the idea was that the value of a good is somehow tied to the amount of labor that went into it. So there is a direct relationship between real energy that people are expending and the skills that they're developing to put into the production of a thing and the value of the thing itself. So it's, it's price in the marketplace, as opposed to price just being a function of people bidding for items. So when you go to the marketplace, the seller of, of a certain set of goods might realize that if he raises the price, fewer of them will sell. If he lowers the price, more of them will sell. And the job of the seller is to figure out how to maximize his profit by setting the price just right so that he can sell the most things and make the most profit. Well, the labor of theory of value says that it's not that bidding process that determines the prices, but it's something more material something less ephemeral and ethereal. It's the amount of labor that goes into producing the good itself. So Marx took a look at that and said, well, if that is really the basis for accruing profit from the sale of a thing, then somebody who wants to make more profit could do so by exploiting the people who are laboring to produce those goods. So he'll find a way to make those people more productive or pay them less or do something so that that difference between the price that it's sold at and the amount of labor hours and the prices that they would have to pay the laborers to um, work on those goods could be maximized. So the capitalist is really trying to pull profit out of the difference between the price at which the thing is sold and the cost of the labor that goes into the thing. Okay, well, if you have that as your fundamental way of looking at profit, then the logic becomes a little bit more straightforward and simple to follow. So the capitalist who is the one who's paying the laborers, is also going to be competing with other capitalists. And the other capitalists around are going to be trying to make profit, but they're also going to be trying to sell more goods at lower prices and produce more of them, which leads them to go out and produce and purchase machinery. And the thing about machinery is machinery can't be exploited. When you purchase machinery to boost your production, you have to pay the full value for that machinery. There's no way that you can cut any corners. The value of the machinery is simply its full value. And as we move into a period of late capitalism, as capitalism develops more and more, we'll have more and more machinery and at the same time, more and more workers will be pushed out because fewer and fewer are needed. But at the same time, that also inhibits the capitalists, the um, people who are paying the wages, from 
making more profit because the only way that you can make profit is by exploiting your laborers. You can't exploit a machine. So this leads to a situation where, as I indicated at the very end of last week's lecture, you have a high degree of mechanization, a high degree of unemployment, and the capitalists themselves are actually not making very much profit. So these are the conditions under which you will inevitably have a revolution. And from that point, the workers of the world will unite together and overthrow the capitalist owners of property and distribute it among themselves. So there are these internal forces within capitalism that will serve to undermine the system. The system is inherently flawed. There is a flaw in the constitution of capitalism itself. It's inherent in the exchange of goods themselves, which is the fact that the only way profit can be made is through the exploitation of labor. Now, when modern economists look at this, they basically just reject the labor theory of value. They don't just reject the Marxist take on it. They reject Adam Smith's version of it. They reject Ricardo's version of it. And today we think we have a much better understanding of exactly how the prices of goods are arrived at. It's much more complex than simply uh, exploiting your labor. It has to do with a lot of other factors. Uh, there are a lot of other ways to make profit besides exploiting labor. And I think that could almost be taken as common sense these days. Ways to make profit could be marketing, advertising, hiring workers who have special skills, um, developing a more efficient organization, developing more productive and useful management styles. The whole study of management has evolved quite a bit since the 1950s. And, you know, there's all of these numerous factors. And a large corporation is almost like a society unto itself with its political structures and its laws and its forms of internal governance and norms of social behavior that are unique to it to try to pin down profit simply to the exploitation of labor should rightly be considered kind of a, a naive way of looking at how profit is actually made in a modern economy. So most Marxists and non-Marxists alike, when they look at Marx's theory of revolution and why it would be inevitable, don't come to the conclusion that based on those ideas that it should be. The premises are simply not strong enough to support the conclusion. But what I would like to get into is the way that Horkheimer and Adorno look at Marxism and what they're able to salvage from it. So the question is, once we get rid of this idea that there's this inevitability of revolution or that there's something internally conflicted within communism that leads inevitably to the exploitation of labor or to unemployment, once we've given up on all those ideas, what are we actually left with? And that's, that's the direction we're going toward the end of the lecture. What I want to say first, what I want to talk about first, is the Marxist idea of crisis, the Marxist doctrine, I guess you could call it, of historical materialism that sets the background for what these critical theorists think they can take from Marxism and go forward with it. So let's, let's talk a little bit about historical materialism as a basis for doing that. Before getting into historical materialism, and I'm going to quote from a text from Marx, just so that we have some firm ground in understanding what Marx might have meant himself, as a teaching aid, as a, uh, as a heuristic device, I want to introduce the idea of a very basic society and try to put the elements together from that. 
So truth be told, I spent some time looking at YouTube videos of African tribes, and uh, I found it very interesting, especially with the kind of stuff that I've been looking at lately. And it gave me the idea for this basic society, which is kind of loosely based on some actual tribal situations that exist in real life today. But my basic society is, is going to be more basic than the reality. So imagine, if you will, a society which has two groups. One group is a group of hunters. Another group is a group of cooks. And we don't need to introduce the, uh, the gender role issue here, but I don't think it wouldn't entirely hurt either just to think about the total ramifications of all these things and the way that societies are divided up and roles are created, etc. But uh, in real life, the hunters are exclusively male. The cooks might not be exclusively female. Some of the males do some cooking, but it's usually more of the sort of, we're going to barbecue this right now variety of cooking, as opposed to cooking that involves cooking beans and other things that might have been picked around locally and thrown into a pot and, and cooked for a while. But they, they could certainly involve uh, parts of an animal that has been slaughtered and killed. But let's say that there are these two social groups. There's hunters and there's cooks. The hunters are men and the cooks are women. Now, with that basic setup, you can also imagine that there's a kind of exchange between these two groups. There are certain power relations between these two groups based upon a natural mode of dependency. And there's also kind of a natural mode of interdependency. One can't really live separately without the other. And they're definitely better together. They're definitely better if both parts of the society are functioning together. And bringing in the tools from last lecture, you could say that this functioning, the functioning of this society is aided by the fact that they probably understand what their goal is, which is probably very simple, which is to go out and eat well. The men go out and find an animal to kill, and the women are finding things to put in the stew, and everybody does their thing, and at the end of the day, they have something good to eat. Um, the hunters go out and they kill the animal, and that takes a certain, uh, certain amount of know-how the women are cooking this food, and that also requires a certain amount of know-how. And those skills themselves, to bring it to the level of adaptation and integration, those skills themselves need to be developed for the society to function better and better, and for there to be more human reproduction in the society, ultimately. And the better that these parts can work together, the better integrated we could say that society is. Below that level, we have the level of pattern maintenance and latency that, that we could relate to the family structure. We can relate to education. So how good are those hunters at teaching and initiating the young males to go out and do the hunting and take over those social roles? How well uh, does the society do? do? How good of a job does the society do at making these young men feel that if they take on that role, that they'll be doing something fulfilling and special and important? And on the same, by the same token, how are the young women of this society brought into their social roles as mothers and as you know, cooks and people who are going out and planting seeds and, you know, collecting the, the beans and the rice or whatever it is that they're able to plant locally. And do they feel like their role is important? Do they feel like they're living a fulfilling life? To what extent does the society 
bring all these factors together, efficiency, adaptation, well-defined roles, people who are actually happy in those roles, and how good is it at fulfilling its goals? If it has all those factors working together, then the system from a Parsonian point of view, just taking that sociological perspective, the GAIL principles introduced last time into this uh, model, you know, if they are functioning well, then we have a well-functioning society. Okay, if we take a look at this basic model, it's much easier to build a Marxist perspective of historical materialism and, and show how that perspective is actually a systematic sociological perspective. And not just one that is just blindly oriented toward a um, inevitable revolution at the end of time, but provides some other tools for thinking about social structures. So I guess what I'll do right now is, is take you to the text itself rather than skipping forward. This excerpt that I'm going to read comes from a contribution to the critique of political economy which is uh, just Marx himself. It's not Marx along with Engels. And it's from close to the beginning of that text. So it's kind of a, kind of a well-known text. So we read, these relations of production, and you can think of relations of production here in terms of uh, the men going out and catching some game, the women collecting the seeds and the fruit and everything that goes into it as production there. These relations of production correspond to a definite stage of development of their material powers of production. Okay, so material powers there could be things like, well, what kind of cooking utensils do they have? Uh, what kind of knives do they have? Uh, what kind of implements do they have to go out and hunt with? Spears, bow and arrow, uh, knives, uh, slings, how well do they know how to use them, how much training do they have, etc. Material powers of production. The sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society. The real foundation on which rise legal and political superstructures and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. So there's a, there's a lot there in that one sentence. So let's, let's just note a few key words here. Some total of those relations of production, the cooks, the hunters, some total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society. Okay, so that's the economic structure of society. And what he's going to say is that that underlies a superstructure, which is everything else that you could say subsequently is built on that basic foundation. So I was mentioning, you know, you need to have people around who are able to teach those skills. Well, that constitutes a certain kind of social relation, teacher, student. You probably also need somebody to keep a certain amount of harmony within this hunting group or somebody who can keep harmony among the cooks. What do you do when a conflict arises? Do you have rules that are supposed to govern behavior and you know, uh, provide a way for developing social norms so that you don't need to have conflict situations arise in the first place? Once you set up these norms and rules and you have people who are there to decide in matters of conflict, you start working your way toward a legal system, you start working your way toward somebody who can act as a judge, somebody who can act as a manager, as a leader, and other roles like father, the teacher, the mother, and for any of these other social roles that get built up where you have one person 
and another person and different levels of power, you're going to have different institutional factors created with the further development of society. So we start from this very basic organization, which might have seemed like it was the most natural thing in the world. Like we can imagine we're, we're a group of people who get lost somewhere in the jungle. And the first thing we do is we just start deciding, well, some of us are going to have to go look for some food and maybe some others are going to have to uh, try to find water. And just from that basic division of labor, that basic organization, maybe it's not getting water, but doing something else, finding their way out of the jungle or whatever. If taken far enough, that leads to a development of a society that only takes time to develop. So the sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society. The real foundation on which rise legal and political superstructures and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. So social consciousness is another point to bring up here. It's, it's especially easy to imagine in cases where you have different power relationships or in cases where conflict arises or may arise and social norms are developed that you may have a form of social consciousness. I am in this role and I'm perhaps subservient to another person who is teaching me or subservient to another person who can act as a judge in, in a certain situation. But it could also be something like between some kind of social consciousness that could arise between these two groups. So the cooks might look at the hunters and say, well, somehow or other, they have more prestige in this society. We don't seem to be as highly regarded as they do. And that may have something to do with the idea that getting the game is the most important thing, that being able to bring home that antelope is really the most important thing. And that may just have to do with human metabolism, human nutrition, the kind of nutritional needs that people have, and what's regarded as tasty. Because perhaps for a lot of people, a life that uh, is spent just eating beans or fruits and things like that would not be a very satisfying life. So the thing that's really important and considered to have a higher prestige value is the um, procurement of meat. Okay, so in that way, you could imagine that some sort of unequal power relationship could develop between the cooks and the hunters. Okay, so there's, there's a way in which you can imagine this social consciousness arising. And then he goes on, the mode of production in material life determines the general character of the social, political, and spiritual processes of life. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but on the contrary, their social existence determines their consciousness. So that's a very important sentence to grasp if the Marxist viewpoint is to be fully appreciated. So it's not, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence. My emphasis should not be on men there, but on consciousness. It is not on the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but on the contrary, their social existence determines their consciousness. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, first of all, what needs to be understood is that this is an argument against a Hegelian view of the evolution of society and the progress of history. Because Hegel's argument was that as our consciousness expands over history, like let's say right now we're beginning to shift toward people eating less and less meat, being more environmentally conscious, that sort of thing. 
as our consciousness and awareness of what we ought to be doing begins to change and shift, our existence begins to shift. You could think of other social examples, like perhaps uh, going back to the French Revolution. Although it's sometimes said that the French Revolution was a class struggle, which is a Marxist interpretation, you could also give what amounts to a Hegelian interpretation of the French Revolution, which is that it wasn't a class struggle, but really a move toward emancipation that got emancipation and liberation from the feudal order of society that really got started through the development of the press. It was really the press that got people talking, that, that developed people's social consciousness of their subservience to these nobles in society as being something that was really unfounded. And that was something that led to that revolution and the eventual uh, beheading of the king. But what, what I want to introduce here is just the idea that we have, on the one hand, an argument for consciousness leading the evolution of society and the progress of history. Consciousness uh, coming from Hegel. And Marx wants to say something quite different. We have these differing views on history. There's Marx versus Hegel. There's idealism on the one hand, which takes consciousness as the most important factor. And for the Marxists, it's something more materialistically oriented, which is um, economic forces in society, which is how we get to the idea of historical materialism. So it's not the development of consciousness. I'm not going to eat any meat products. Instead, I'm going to eat veggie burgers and save the planet. It's not, it's not the growth of consciousness, but it's actually economic forces. So in favor of a Marxist view, something like a shift from an agrarian basis for an economy to an industrial basis of the economy caused a radical shift in the entire structure of society, moving from pre-industrial revolution to the industrial revolution in the uh, 18th or 19th century. So there is some merit to both of those views, but unfortunately it seems like Marx wants to treat historical materialism as something that has just got to be the only explanation. So that Hegelian explanation is something that he's going to reject. And one of the reasons that he gives for opting in favor of historical materialism is that it's something that can be approached scientifically. So how, how can you quantify shifts in consciousness? How can you talk about this except in, except in a way that invites subjectivity? You know, how are people thinking about this? How are they feeling about this? How can, how can you approach that in a scientific way? So he thought looking at changes in forces of production might allow you a more scientific way of approaching history. So notice that that type of argument doesn't necessarily mean that Hegel is wrong. It's, it doesn't really count as a counter argument to the Hegelian approach. It just simply says, we really don't have any adequate means of assessing the Hegelian viewpoint, and we can assess the historical materialist viewpoint much better. There's a historian named Wilhelm Dilthey who um, developed a way of approaching history that emphasized looking at the way people thought about the events themselves that they were involved in as a way of bringing out meaning in history. But that's kind of a uh, sidetrack that could be considered a way of bringing Hegel, a, Hege a set of Hegelian principles into a historical narrative without seeming to leave objectivity entirely out of a historical narrative. <laughs>
Okay, but I'm not going to get sidetracked into that discussion. So the other thing that I was going to do, now that I think I've, I've adequately given the basis for understanding historical materialism, how Marx can be looked at as providing some valuable sociological principles, ways of looking at society from a sociological perspective that maybe weren't really adequately discussed before Marx, is to move into critical theory. So critical theorists are people who acknowledge, and this includes Marcuse, Horkheimer, Adorno, definitely Habermas, people who acknowledge that this pure Marxist theory of the development of history has its flaws. There's nothing inevitable about a communist revolution. And there's more than one way to assess the evolution of society. There are more factors that would go into it than just exploiting your workers on the one hand, or just purely looking at society in terms of economic substructures and political, religious, um, and other kind of ideological structures that would be built on that economic structure. Oh, there's one thing I, I want to mention here. I think it's worth mentioning and, and retracing my steps, which is um, another way in which you can see idealism, historical idealism, the idea about consciousness as determining the evolution of society, which is if you go back to an archaic period, one of the leading factors in the consciousness of the order of the world of society and how people understand their place in the universe is people looking up at the heavens and noticing the regularities in the heavens. So movements of the stars, the permanence of lights in heaven, all those factors which are more obvious, I think you could say, at least to the mind of the people who have studied, people who, uh, primitive people who looked at the heavens, as something that is divine, and those are things that have divine characteristics. Permanence, regularity, perhaps a kind of eternality to them, and something that is above and beyond material circumstances as we experience them here on Earth. So um, people being born and people dying, pets being born and dying, crops growing, coming to fruition, and then dying. This is what we see in the world around us. At times in history, people have written about this as, you know, the joy and the sorrow of life. And if we look at the heavens, it appears that we can find something above and beyond the inevitability of those sorrows that come with those joys. And it's not too hard to try to extrapolate all sorts of things from the idea of permanence and oneness and eternality as providing a basic set of metaphysical principles that have structured the entire development of Western metaphysics, religion, and even scientific thinking, because those are exactly the sorts of things that we look for in our theories, the, the kind of basic things we expect from something that we could count as knowledge. It's something that takes us above and beyond our uh, involvement in the change of things in this world that is sometimes pictured as the wheel of fortune. I don't think of Pat Sajak here, although now that I've mentioned it, it's, it's impossible not to. Don't think of Pat Sajak and Vanna White and somebody turning letters around in a game show. Instead, think of a, of a lady who uh, stands at the center of a wheel and as the wheel comes up, we have fortunate situations. And as the wheel inevitably turns down, we have a kind of declining from 
those fortunate circumstances. And that is the human situation. That is the human situation that a lot of people throughout history would have liked to try to overcome. And a way of overcoming that and reaching up toward the divine is by reaching toward permanence, things that don't change, and eternality. This was kind of a speculation of mine when I started thinking about this, but I was glad to see that it was confirmed very abundantly in, in a book by Mircea Eliade called Cosmos and History. And what I'd like to do is just read a very short section from this. Here he's talking about Moses and his encounter with Jehovah on Mount Sinai. It's a point that I think very well illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. So this is from page seven of Cosmos and History. The temple in particular, preeminently the sacred place, had a celestial prototype. So there we have a kind of mirroring of heaven and earth. And this divine thing is the celestial prototype that we're going to try to bring down to earth. On Mount Sinai, and, and by that very fact, is going to become something holy and revered. On Mount Sinai, Jehovah shows Moses the form of the sanctuary that he is to build for him. Quote, According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And look that thou make them after their pattern which was showed thee on the mount. That's from Exodus 25, verses 9 and 40. And when David gives his son Solomon the plan for the temple buildings, for the tabernacle, and for all their utensils, he assures him that, quote, All this the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. That is from 1 Chronicles 18, verse 29. And finally, Eliad concludes the paragraph with the sentence, Hence, he had seen the celestial model. And I think this point is sometimes not quite grasped by people who read about archaic societies and mythology. And, you know, there's this, I guess, tendency to not quite appreciate just how important the influence of the heavens was on people's daily lives. And I think that the point to take away is, is that what's going up going on up there in heaven is not just a mirror it's it's not just something that is just out there but it's something that as human civilization develops and as myths like the prometheus myth and the couple of examples that i just read out of eliad as those El those Examples illustrate the idea that people are trying to bring the divine into their lives. They're trying to bring the divine into being through themselves in some way. And it manifests itself with these heavenly characteristics, which are not just, you know, images of people in white robes or men with long beards or whatever they happen to be, but have these properties like permanence and um, eternality and regularity to them and unity that make them divine. And so it's these divine models that have had a tremendous influence on the development of Western metaphysics, theology, and the kinds of values that we have. Okay, so I want to shift back now to discussion of critical theory, and I think I'll be able to make this a little bit more brief. So the takeaway is that the critical theorists, 
and I've kind of been led in, in different directions in assessing what their importance actually is. Because the way I was taught to think about critical thinking is that it's this meditation on the Enlightenment. It's really people following World War II who had an experience with World War II assessing the Enlightenment project and whether the Enlightenment project was, was something that was... Uh, that needed to be criticized and trying to assess that as a project for Western civilization. But I think that emphasis is maybe a little bit misplaced. What I think the core, what I think the actual core of critical theory is, is it's what you could call the humanist side of Karl Marx. And to bring that out, I'm going to read a little bit from Marcuse. So Marcuse emphasizes that there is a way in which you could think of society as dehumanizing its own members. So members of a society and a capitalist society become more and more dehumanized the more that their lives become more and more regulated in this industrial setting. People become more and more, come more and more to resemble machines and become the kind of assistants of machines instead of artisans in the Renaissance period who started a project and became craftsmen and worked on a piece uh, that they had to craft with their own hands all the way through like an artist and was an expression of their selves and became something that would be more fulfilling you know, and in contrast to that sort of situation, you have the industrial worker who simply does one task in a very repetitive manner and doesn't get to feel the um, extension of his labor, the, the extension of his personal growth through his labor. So here's a couple of quotes from Marcuse. Man can only realize his essence if he realizes it as something objective by using his essential powers to produce an external, material, objective world. It is in his work in this world, in the broadest sense, that he is real and effective. Quote, in creating a world of objects by his practical activity, in his work upon inorganic nature, man proves himself a conscious species being. In this activity, man shows himself as the human being he is, according to his species, as distinct from animal, vegetable, and inorganic being. We will examine the central concept of objectification at a later stage below. Labor, understood in this way, is the specifically human affirmation of being, in which human existence is realized and confirmed. And the Marxist point of view is that in our capitalist society, the kind of labor that people do does not allow them to fully realize their humanity, that it doesn't develop themselves, that it doesn't allow people to develop themselves as human beings. And it's this concern with the human aspects of what it means to live in a particular society that is the heart of their focus. So when Horkheimer and Adorno discuss pop culture and the degrading effects of pop culture that it has on society in the dialectic of enlightenment, what their concern is, is to show that even beyond what Marx says and all those you know, ideas about an inevitable revolution, what they want to implicitly try to argue is that such a revolution might be justified by the fact that even in this American society, which is very affluent, and in a society where you might think everything might be laid, laid out and made available for people to develop themselves more fully as human beings, they simply aren't doing that. And one of the reasons why is because of the pop culture that has kind of taken the place of art. What people do in their leisure hours is really just a kind of escape from their working hours. 
And instead of a society in which people develop themselves as full human beings in terms of their rationality and in terms of all the other sorts of ways that they could develop and evolve and grow as human beings, instead, they kind of go for the cotton candy. They get interested in things that really are more like diversions than they are like real, you know, nutritious food, you know, something really solid that, that you could really build and grow with. So with that, I think I've come to a stopping point. I think I've pretty well covered everything that I would, that I wanted to cover. I think these points are all very important points to take into reading of critical theory in general, but also into reading legitimation crisis. Because Haramas definitely acknowledges that the Marxist viewpoint is very valuable in terms of assessing society, but he also wants to go beyond it. And sometimes he goes back to the Marxist perspective, and sometimes he leaves it. And as the quote that I began the lecture indicates, he doesn't actually see the Marxist viewpoint as a viewpoint that entirely explains what would account for social evolution, social change, or might lead to a revolution in society. So with that, I'll call it a night.